Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. We give God praise. We give him thanks one more time for this moment in time that we can truly acknowledge God as our Lord and Savior. And today, I truly would like to reach out to the John family who had lost their eldest brother. May his soul rest in peace and may they be comforted. I want to give God praise and thanks for the ceremony that I observed that took place yesterday. It is, it is and was very interesting. I think it was a good ceremony. He couldn't ask for more. So he got a real good send off and may the Lord, may you find peace with God. And those who are left behind, may you be comforted knowing that he lived a good life. Again, we give God praise for the opportunity to come in his presence and to ask of God for mercy. And this we will do today as we go into our lessons. And the lesson today is Acts 13. Again, it's showing us here God's way of spreading the gospel or the church to the world. And one, one of the things that you would observe here is not about color, creed, or race. This lesson is going to share with us some insights on who we are as a people. And we would learn to appreciate ourselves even more, you know, because we, we look at everything. You know, we, we feel so insufficient. And the reason why we feel so insufficient is because of the way in which the gospel is being handed out to us. You know that we believe everything in the gospel is just pertaining to our upper class pedigree. This is not what God is doing. This is not what the Bible is all about. And we are going to go into some of these areas here, again, which speaks to us pertaining to God's heart. So let us ask God guidance. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I thank you for this privilege that I can come to you. I thank you that I can ask of you for mercy, forgiveness, for guidance, and for directive. Watch over us, dear God, and keep us as the apple of thine eyes. You know, church, in many cases, many of us, you know, have been told by so many The only black people in the Bible was the slaves. So wrong. And again, all of this is because of the subliminal seduction that the world presented. But I want you to see how good God is. Even those who write the Bible, who interpreted the Bible, not write the Bible, but who interpreted the, the Hebrew language, the Greek language, and every, the Aramaic language that the Bible were written in, it was presented to us in a certain way. But in the midst of all of this, there was certain truth that could not be hid. Why? Because they did not write it on their own or interpret it on their own. They interpreted again, this again came all through the inspiration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So to understand who we are and realize how cosmopolitan the heart of our Lord and Savior is, you know, we say the islands are cosmopolitan and there are those in the islands that are more cosmopolitan. Some of the islands are more cosmopolitan than some, we know this. But when we look carefully and we see what it is that is going on and what was being handed out to us. Even those who ministered the word unto us was not us, was not people like us. And we have to understand this. It was the powers that be. And they ruled the world. And I am calling out to you today and all my fellow ministers that we take a good look and see what is written and what is handed out to us. I want to say this, you know, in all the books, as I traveled the spirit, as I traveled the way of the spirit, 
The book that was given unto me is the Bible. So I had no choice but to research. You know, and some of the things that I'm hearing, you know, everything black is the devil. So far from the truth. God made, and I'm, I'm going this way because this is the month we can truly express our feelings. This is Black History Month. And to our young people, they need to know. And what I'm seeing is that it's not being shared. Oh, we don't need this. We're speaking of genealogy. No, but the scripture says, man, know thyself. And if we are not here seeking to know ourselves and to understand who we are as a people and as God's servant, like every other creed or race, who appreciate themselves, I'm calling out to you tonight to appreciate yourself as an instrument of righteousness and an instrument of grace. And as we go into this lesson, it's going to speak so powerfully to us. And I'm certain that we have all read this 15th chapter. And then we would go into some other areas here of the Bible. You will realize this is why I traverse the Bible. I don't just stay in one area because I want to know. And what I know I'm going to share with you. Because when I'm gone, when I'm long gone, I expect you to come back into these words and speak of them powerfully and say, Thus said the Lord, not thus said Bishop Xavier. It has nothing to do with me. It is all about God. So I would like you to look carefully, walk with me this morning. And we're going to take the first chapter, the first verse of the 13th chapter. And sometimes you may hear me confusing chapter and verse. Bear with me. Follow me in the lesson and you will get it right. Hear what it says in this first verse of the 13th chapter. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manin that had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and so on. Now I want you to observe this here. A teaching that was shared with me. Study the names in the Bible. And when you begin to study the names in the word of God, you are going to know who they are. Among the sons of Noah, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, Japheth ruled the Ethiopian world. This is where he went. But you would learn when you study the names of, between Ham and Shem, they carry similar names in their tribes. Ham is the progenitor of the African, and Shem is the Semitic people. And when you look carefully, the Chaldeans let us learn our history. The Chaldeans are not white. The Syrians are not white. We must understand this and we accept the fact that Ham is black, but yet still a multicolor black. Different. Without, you know, the only unpolluted people were the Ethiopian people. I wonder if this is why our father Abraham took an Ethiopian wife after Sarah died. You know, all of these things we don't look at, they seem so simple and we read them and we say, well, yes, Ketorah, when he, after Sarah died, he was lonely and he married, but he had sons and daughters with her. I want you to know this. And anything that I white is of a different color. So we must be able to appreciate ourselves and walk with this. So I'm going to try to share something with you here. Let us look here. Remember, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Certain prophets and teachers. I want you to think again. Just for a minute. Just for a minute. 
Where was the church started? Or when the children of Israel, when did we get the name Christian? You would see that in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, around the 26th verse. The name Christian was not a name that was fabulous. It comes like somebody called you a thief. And you know what it feels like when you are called a thief. And this is how they categorize those who are walking according to the way of Christ. So if we are studying this first chap this first verse here, you are going to see many things that you have and I have to think again about. So when we look at the name Simon that was called Niger, the interpretation of Niger is black. That was called Niger. Hey, black man. Are you hearing that? Are you seeing that? That was called black. You don't look at a, a, a fair-skinned man and, and call him black man. No. You don't refer to nobody out of their, their standing. So when we begin to understand what this is saying here to us, the prophets in the church where Christianity first started. And from there, God spread out the message unto the world. And you are going to see that as we go down into the lesson. And how important it is for us to take that time to sit back and understand. And when we get these opportunities in these times, let us use it. Let us teach. But you can't give out what you don't have inside. So we have to start with something. So let's look at this here. Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene. Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is North Africa, the Libyan people. The Libyans. I want you to understand this. From Libya and from other parts of the world, we had Christians. People who believed and people who would, again, I read to you, and there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. So when we sit here just receiving all that was given unto us and not trying to analyze it and to know where we are, then we are not doing anything. So we begin to try to be like everybody else rather than try to understand who we are. And this is what is important here. So among the teachers and the prophets of the Christian faith, we had brothers who were very powerful in their message. Receiving from God the messages. This is what a prophet does. He receives from God and he shares. And in this you will see, in this verse here, God is so cosmopolitan. He used people from every race. Among the five prophets that were here in this lesson, they had no color barrier as we have today. There was no prejudice as we have today. In the churches, in the world, in the, our politics, let us look carefully The Indians going one way and the Negroes going the other way and yet still we call ourselves under one nation, under one God. But if you listen to this carefully here, you would see that there was no difference between these people. Many things were shown here. Among them, they, all, they were all persecuted alike. Evangelism spread among them. They went out and they began to work with one another. They break bread and eat together. So when we think again where we are and what we are doing and why we are finding ourselves in areas even... You see, Manin, who, was, who had been brought up under Herod the Tetrarch and Saul... 
Saul said, you are a Roman, I'm a Roman. You are a Greek, I'm a Greek. So we know who Saul was. Many coming up under Herod, we understand who he is also. But we must also understand who Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, they were all prophets receiving from God the messages to establish the world's church. So you are not left out. If you are left out, you left yourself out. And I'm calling out to you tonight to understand who you are. You would observe that even among the, the children on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and when you go back to the second chapter of Acts, you would see people from all over the world coming together and questioning the power of God's Holy Spirit, wondering what is happening because they were seeing condemned people, people who were condemned, people who were rejected, speaking in their own language, these all unlearned fishermen, being able to speak in, in every language that was under the sun at the time. Let us take a look here. The third verse of the second chapter, I'm beginning there. But I want you to remember, the very first verse says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. Oneness they were walking in. Not being separated, and even in the organizations, various organizations now, we are having separation. Men of God separating one from another. Men of God lying to one another. We don't want him in this meeting, you know, because he opposes everything that we say. He don't agree with us. But this should be a healthy thing. This should be something that we, we should appreciate because someone is free enough to say exactly what he or she thinks. And if we are going wrong, you will see that Peter and Paul, Paul and Peter had a confrontation because Peter was very prejudiced in his walk. What are you saying, Bishop Xavier? Peter was prejudiced in his walk and he was considered to be the false proof. He was very prejudiced because when he sat with the Gentiles, he would eat and drink with them. But when he would see the Jews, he would get up from the Gentiles and do like if he didn't know them. And I've experienced that even among your very own. So we have to look at all of these things. But observe here, when the day of Pentecost, Peter was among them. Paul wasn't there. But when Paul came to know Christ, he had to confront Peter. And let him know, hey, how could you do this? Do you know that they received the Holy Ghost just as you and I? Or just as we have? Is there any difference? between the worshiping? No, there wasn't. So when we sit back here and we begin to, this is, I had to come back to the first verse. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house and they that were sitting and they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it was sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Today, I, you know, I'm hearing what Holy Ghost you're talking about. Even when you're praying and you might say, Father, send forth the Holy Spirit. Help me to understand. The teacher that you promised. There are men who are sitting in high authority. Confirm, conf listen, what Holy Ghost you're talking about. They, they don't believe. How could you teach? Or what are you teaching? And as a matter of fact, go a little further. Who are the ones teaching you? And anyone who cannot first confess that Jesus Christ was sent in the flesh is not of God. So based on your teaching and not accepting that Jesus Christ came and Jesus Christ made a promise unto us that it, it is expedient for me to go. And if I didn't go, he, not she, he. I'm talking to some bishops here. And it's time for you to understand. 
So we have to know where we are going. We have to know what we are doing. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Listen. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this noise was spread abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they were that every man heard them speak. I'm speaking of the twelve. Every man heard them speak. And something, you know, they had to, it wasn't eleven, you know. It was twelve. But even after the crucifixion and the, the, the punishment of, 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 of um, Judas, they had to bring the number back up. So they had to cast lots. And in casting lots, it fell upon Mark. And they made the twelve. Let us come together and understand the mysteries in numbers. And speak to God and ask him for the wisdom of the numbers. So that we can and will give honor, full glory and honor. So they're here being united. The 13th had been taken up. He is no longer with them but sitting at the right hand of the Father. You know we say the number 13 is, is evil. The number 13 is but the number 13 is glorious. Jesus made up the 13. He glorified God by saying, All those whom you have given unto me, I have lost none except the son of perdition. And he kept that 12. And he fed them. With all that the Father had given unto him. But I like the seventh verse. And they were all amazed. This is the people who gathered around. And marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak unto us Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own language wherein we were born, Parthos and Medes, Parth Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in, the, in Mesopotamia, and in Judah, and Cappadocia, and in Pontus, and Asia, Paraguay, and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya. Come on, church. Rome, Jews and proselytes, Crete and Arabian. We do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mock, saying they are full of wine. But here's where Peter stood up with one voice. With, observe what it says here. He stood up with the eleven. Lifted up his voice and stand and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, and ye that dwelleth in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken with wine, supposing seeing it's the third hour of the day. I'm going back to my lesson. I wanted you to see that. Egypt, Libya. I wonder if this same Simon of Cyrene here is the one who assisted Jesus in carrying the cross. I wonder, probably so. Some of the footnotes says yes, but I don't know. So I'm gonna go with the footnotes. I'm going to receive that. So as we go along in these lessons here, what I'm trying to share with you and show you is how important you are and each and every nation. So when we stand aside to be condemned, and at the same time, we are condemning others. Are we walking in the cosmopolitan unity of the spirit that Jesus has exercised here in the extending of the church? 
bringing the church in one, using people from every nation, having his 12 disciples to speak unto them in their own tongues. Isn't it these unlearned men? These old fishermen? You know, we take education today and we put it at the top of the ladder. When we come to spiritual work and understanding, if education and the spirit cannot work together, you are doing nothing. And we have to understand this. And this is why I says to you, the Bible speaks literally, figuratively, and symbolically. In our churches, you will see certain vessels. If you don't understand them, go before God. He said, if you seek me, you will find me. Don't stand and condemn certain things that you have no understanding of. In the book of John, he says, she, the church. The Holy Spirit now speaking as a church, as a mother. She, the church. Understand the symbolic reference there. The body of Christ is here represented as a woman bringing souls unto righteousness, bringing souls into confession. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the everlasting gospel. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very end. So as Dr. Stalin said, one of our great Calypsonian, he said, know yourself. He said, stand up. Love yourself. Feel good about yourself. And this is what I'm trying to tell you today. Unite in the spirit of peace, in the spirit of love, Stop being the crabs in the barrel and continually pulling down each other. We don't need this. And the only reason why we are doing this in so many cases is because we don't know how powerful we are. You don't know who you are. The very beginning of the church, the ministry in the New Testament began with men from Libya, began with men from Egypt, began with men from Africa. I want you to understand this. This is what the lesson is saying. This is not what Bishop Xavier is saying. He said, and they ministered. There are many things here that I would like to share with you, you know. But again, three major factors that I would like to share with you here that take place in this chapter. The spread of the gospel in the early church. There were things that they went through. The new missionary program that was set up, evangelism to the Gentiles, and a cosmopolitan body of believers sent forth to carry the message of faith. Let us think again, let us understand what we are doing, let us understand why we are going this way. And they went out sharing the great news, telling the world how sweet the name of Jesus song, even though they were, cast, they were criticized, they were cast, cast aside, because they were not doing it the way the Jews believed they should do it. The Jews did not understand or fully accept Jesus as the Messiah. And they couldn't receive him as the Messiah because if they receive him as the Messiah, all that they had in mind that this king was coming to ride on six black horses and to beat down the Romans, this is not what Jesus came for. And even in this very first chapter, if you are looking carefully, you would see here, cosmopolitan, a cosmopolitan spirit, a unity of spirit, walking in oneness, whether you be red, yellow, black, or white, to spread the good news. And God will use us 
in areas that he sees fit. So as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost, not Jesus Christ. And am I putting down Jesus Christ? No, I'm not. Without Jesus Christ, we would have no Holy Ghost, but we have to elevate him as Ezekiel saw him sitting on that pearly throne above the heavens. But his promise was faithful. He said, if I didn't go, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost would not come. And the good thing about that is he said, he will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me and the things that he hear from me. That will he teach you. So if you're rejecting the teaching of the Holy Ghost, who is teaching you? There's a question here. Or what is teaching you? Where are you getting your information from? So when we look at all of these areas here, being fast, you know, they're fasting because they were waiting, they were looking for something. Why do we go to fast? We are seeking to be enlightened and there is a way to do things. A spiritual way of doing things. And when we're doing things in that spiritual manner, he say, listen, this is why I speak unto you in parables. He said, I speak unto you in parables, Matthew 10, Matthew 13, 10 and 11. He said, I speak unto you in parables. I speak unto them in parables. But it is given to you to understand these parables and share it with them. And if you cannot receive these parables, and if you didn't get these parables, these messages of faith, these tokens of faith, this symbolic reference, don't do it. And don't condemn someone else who is doing what they are told to do. And as they fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. There are some things you're going to see in this lesson here. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Paul had just taken over the work of the Gentiles from Peter. Paul and Barnabas was now sent unto the Gentiles the way that Peter was walking. It was taken away from him. Was he degraded? No. And this is why sometimes, you see, we have to understand in the faith what is happening. There might be somebody who is a little more eloquent or at least more equipped than you in your having better spiritual understanding. But you are the one given the gift to do certain things. And that individual who is going to be sitting there is going to see the errors that you are making. And in love, he may come to you and say unto you, listen, this is not how it's done. But you are looking at your office rather than ask a question. It is time that we start asking questions so that we can grow and understand what God is saying to us. Simeon that was called Niger. The footnote here says, the black, the black. This is what the footnote says. So I'm not prejudiced here in any way. I'm loving everyone. And I want us to understand this. Simeon called Niger the black. Manning, who grew up under Fair Herod, whether he was Romans or Greek or whatever. But we know Simon of Cyrene, North Africa, man of Cyrene, had begun to minister the gospel of Christ. Even though now what we are seeing in so many of these areas, the Muslims have taken over. But remember where it started. 
And even now there are still faithful Christians in those areas. They may not be able to exercise their full authority because they are going to be condemned, beaten down. You know, in certain areas you cannot even walk with a Bible now. If you are seen with a Bible, why, you, why do you feel that threat? Why can't we share the oneness? Why can't we share the love that this 13th chapter is sharing with us? So they began, so they're being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and, to, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus, speaking to the Gentiles, sharing the good news to the Gentiles. There are some things I would like to, to an area of scripture here I would like to really take you into. So that you can really understand who you are. You know, one of the questions that I had asked myself in many cases, and you see that way in the book of Genesis, when Jesus was preparing Moses from the third and fourth and fifth chapter, and Moses began to ask God the question, who should I say sent me? And Moses said, and God said unto him, I am that I am. Moses began to question he was right because he did not fully understand this almighty God. And at the same time, this phenomenon, I call it a phenomenon that is taking place. You're looking at the bush burning, but yet still not being consumed. There are questions. And if we just stand up and look at it and ask no questions, then we are... We're not walking according to the two foundations. It's either you're wise or you're foolish. This is Jesus teaching the seventh chapter of Matthew, verses 20, you know, from verse 21. The wise man built his house on the rock, that when the storm come against it, and he is considered a wise man. The wise, but the man that built his house on the sand, is considered a foolish man. I'm using the words of the Bible. So I am saying to you, if you are traveling, or if you have traveled the way of the Spirit, and all you're seeing is getting what they give to you, and you're grabbing what they give to you, you know, and you're asking no question, probably your teacher even know how to ask questions. So what we have to do is what Jesus did. Remember he gave us three keys? What are those keys? You'll find it in Matthew 7 and 7. Beautiful keys. We speak it in our homes. We speak it in the church. And the keys are seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. So according to the way of the spirit, what makes us wise? When we ask questions. We go into school, we are in class. What makes us wise? The asking of questions. When we begin to ask questions, what it will do? It will help us. Communication, this is how we put it in one word. Communication is man's greatest asset. With questions come answers. And with, listen, with answers, you hear what I said? With questions come answers. With answers, we have dialogue. So this is what communication is. So when I ask you something, and you might say something to me, and I, I cannot fully accept that, or I cannot really receive that. So what I do? I ask questions. Why are you saying this? You may not like me asking you that, but I'm going to ask, because this is what it is. So as I began to study the word, and you would understand what is happening here, when we look at the situation in the world and what is happening among us, let us take a look. Remember, I'm speaking to you. This is Black Month. Black History Month. And the time has come for us to understand and seek to know what is happening. And if you would go with me to the book of Zephaniah, 
That is about three books back of the New Testament. You'd have Zephaniah or Haggai, you'd have Zacharias, Malachi. So you, you know, you're not going too far back into the Old Testament. It's about three books back, three or four books back. So I'm looking here at the first chapter of Zephaniah, and I want to read a few verses from this chapter here, and then we're going to go into the to the, third, to the third chapter of Zephaniah. And hear what it says in the word. The word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah the son of Cushi. Church, I said to you and I'm going to say it again. And this is something that you could take anywhere. When you study the names and understand the names, it's going to give you a very good idea of the part that the Africans played in the book. The part the African played in the message of faith. The part that the African played in the spreading of the church, in the spreading of the gospel. And these are not my words. I'm just sharing with you here. And we're going to break down some of these names. Zephaniah, the son of Cush, Cushy, as it says here, the son of Gadila, listen to these names, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, Hezekiah was black, did you know that? Did I know that? I didn't. But as we begin to study the word, we are going to understand what God is saying here, and what the word is saying, and what these inspired men, remember what Paul says, he said, this word was given unto us through inspiration, holy men. Because these men were also fasting in order to bring forth this word that we are reading, reading here today. And this is without compromisation. This is without class. This is not according to education. But this is according to inspiration. And this is where we lack very big. The son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in, in the days of Hosea. Was Hosea black? Oh, oh, come on. The son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. This is a message that came from God. Let us try to understand some of these names here and see what it's saying here. The prophet's genealogy shows, the prophet's genealogy shows his royal relationship to Hezekiah. His royal relationship to Hezekiah. The godly, the goodly king of Judah, who had in 686 BC, Hosea was Judah's last godly king during whose reign the law was rediscovered in 621 BC. I want you to understand what is happening here. I'm going to go through an area, a group of six, six groups are singled out for judgment. This is a message that Zephaniah was bringing, the son of Cushi. The son of Gadila, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, one blood church. Everyone played their part in the ministry of faith. Everyone part played their part. So let us not, you know, feel left out, but know that you have a place. But if we never shared it with you, how could you know this? The eunuch. Understand us what thou readest? How can I if there is no one to teach me? So if we are not seeking to teach ourselves, if we are not seeking to understand this word that is speaking to us, if we are not seeking to recognize the fact that we have to study the genealogies, we have to study the names, and see how important a part they play 
in our walk. Yes, we have to go through situations because we deny the oracles of God. We were condemned by even God himself. He turned his back on us as he turned his back on his only begotten son. At that point that he became sin. Funny, eh? But God delivered up his own son because he was that sacrifice to bring us back to him. And this is why, to the end of it all, he said, Father, it is finished. God delivered up his own son. Why, church, we must understand this? Because at that time, the burden of sin, the sin of the world, was upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hence the reason when he prayed, he perspired blood, sweat, and tears. That burden of sin was so heavy. Father, can, hello, can you not take this cup away from me? The burden of sin was so heavy upon our Lord and Savior. And this is what Zephaniah is sharing the message of faith and he is speaking to six groups as singled out for judgment. Let us look at some of the groups. The remnant of Baal. Those who continue to worship idols having feet cannot walk. Having hands, cannot feel. Having ears, cannot hear. Having eyes, and cannot see. Having a throat, and cannot speak. Think about this. And this is a message that this black man here, Cush, is the son of Ham. I kept that for last. Cush is the son of Ham. And who is Ham? The progenitor of the black race or the African people. So when we begin to think about all of these things, we need to teach ourselves so that we can teach others. It is here. It is written. I like the words of Jesus. Isn't it written in your Bible? Isn't it written in your law? But if you are not searching, you cannot find it. So let's search and let's search with diligence so that we can find and understand. So the first group here is the remnant of Baal, the idolatrous. Two, the idolatrous peace, the idolatrous priests. Those who continued to worship Baal. Three, them that worship the host of heaven upon the house tops. Four, them that worship and swear by the Lord and that swear by Malchan, devotees of secretic worship. Now I want you to think again. I want you to think again. You hear as we walk the street and, and little children, even on the radio, or even on the television, you, the quickest thing you will hear, I swear. I want to tell you something. This is dangerous. The scripture says you ought not to swear, whether by earth or by heaven. Whether by earth or by heaven. So you're swearing in the name of God? Church, all of these things is what the Jews were doing. Understand where we are going with this. But then who were the Jews? It is for this reason he scattered us. Now, our father Abraham, coming from Iraq, the Iraqis are not white. So we will understand what is happening. So our lineage went so far that we don't know who we are. It's sad to say, but we need to know who we are. The only woman upon the face of God's earth 
that can make a perfect black, a perfect white, a perfect shiny, a perfect whatever. Green eye, blue eye is a black woman. The master genie. Respect yourself. What we are trying to do now is we are trying to be like everybody else. And in these scriptures here, you would see that God was angry with them. Whom he had called and given the oracles, God was angry with them. And this is what we're doing. I was listening to a, ch a program in St. Vincent this morning. And one of the members said, we leave off all God's hymn and we sing in songs now. We're no longer singing hymns anymore. You know, when we used to exercise faith, our elders who are walking and we, we don't know where we're going sometimes and we, we have to cry out to Jesus and they would start to sing just a little anthem, some, sometimes two verses, two words, but they prolong it. Standing by me, standing by me. Jesus of Nazareth is standing by me. You know, you have certain faith that you exercise and you are now walking in this because I'm not alone. He is at my side. When we feel so down and troubled and we cannot go and we feel that it's, it's all done, the leader will say, Keep your feet. And he began to groan. Arise, my soul. Arise, shake off thy guilty fears. Shake off that guilty fears. And walk in the name of Jesus. Stand up. I remember God calling out to Job. He says, stand up like a man and gird yourself. And this is what the leaders did. You call them ignorant. You call them stupid. And you know, they are not as bright as you are today. But they had inspiration. And this is what we need to seek after. The inspiration of God. Speaking to us from within. That we can sit right here. And when God is speaking to somebody sitting in the seat, you will see them get up from there, come take a glass of water and go to the door. When our elders at what? Thank you, Lord. When our elders at one time had to keep the meeting and hiding, and then all of a sudden, you, would see, you call that voodoo, eh? but I call it wisdom of God. And all of a sudden, you see the man of the church get up and take a glass of water and go to the door and throw three sips of water and the police come in and every one of them come in and sit down and take worship and when the worship is finished they leave and go on. You call that voodoo, eh? But I call that the hands of God. The shield of God. As one brought a message this morning in the 15th Psalm. Let us take that shield of God. Let us cover us, cover ourselves under the blanket of God that when the enemy sees us he will pass us on the other side. Think about who you are. Think about where you are. Go back and read it. Psalm 115. Take the shield of God. Take the breastplate of God. And we know what a shield is. When we are in war, you see, when the Romans fighting, they were so good. They had they used to form their shield in a manner that you cannot penetrate and they're coming against you. And all you could do is to back back. And this is what's happening today. So they come in and they sit down and the minister preach. And when he gets in frightened, the mother tells him, preach your gospel. And he preach. And after he preach, take your eyes off of them, preach the word. And he preached. And after he finish, and he close, and he give God praise. And when they begin now, they begin to pray. We thank you, Lord. Praise God from whom all goodness flow. And we begin to sing and we begin to give honor and begin to give praise. Them clapping too. 
They clapping too. Where is that today? And you say that's a Kellogg? That's whole time? You say we don't need that anymore? The church has evolved? To what extent has the church evolved? That people walking in and walking out sick? This is what you call evolution? We should be doing, you know, not blowing on people and throwing them down and all this kind of thing. Jesus said, want that. You're doing voodoo. We don't need that. What we need is the gift of healing. We could stand here and we could speak. And in speaking, that person is being healed. Then they see they run up to you and then you have, you have to lay hands on them. A brother came to church this morning. Who is doing chemo? He said, Bishop, when I got up this morning, I wasn't feeling too good. And you know, I share these testimonies with you. He said, I wasn't feeling too good. He said, I feel so burdened down. He said, but something tell me I have to be here. And we wasn't no big number. But he came. And when he came, he just walked up because this is one of the morning that I said, I'm not going to preach. Give the church the opportunity. I've been preaching to you for all these years. Let them preach. And this is what I do from time to time. And he came up and he ministered. And one of the things that he ministered on was Psalm 116 and verse 15. Precious is the death of the saint in the sight of the Lord. I said to him, you have received your blessing. May God continue to go with you in all your appointed ways. So when we begin to see what is happening here, church, according to these areas here, them that worship and swear by the Lord and swear by Malchon, devotees of secretic worship system. Number five. Them that turn their backs from the Lord. I ain't doing this no more. I ain't doing this no And you was doing it all the time, you know. But all of a sudden, you can't understand it because it was never given to you. It's something you start off doing. So what you're telling me, you was a copier, you're a copycat, you're watching what somebody else doing and doing it, and now you realize that you're confused. I ain't doing this no more. I want you to think again. Church, we are in a place where we have, you're condemning the church. We grew up in the spiritual Baptist faith. We were anointed, we were given names in the faith. And then all of a sudden, you throw the faith aside. But God don't mind that. You're baptized in the faith and then all of a sudden, you can't change that baptism. No matter what they do to you, you're already baptized. You are who you are. So we have to take stock of these things and understand where we are. So I'm calling out to you. Six, those that have not sought the Lord. So I called out six points here for you. Those who have not sought the Lord. And as a Christian, as a child of God, and as a, a black man, I want you to know. Hear what it says in the ninth verse of the third chapter of Zephaniah. For them... Then will I turn to the people, turn the people to a pure language. Turn to the people a pure language. That they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. I can go further on in this lesson here. But I want you to see that. When we, you remember, they were confounded at the Tower of Babel. But God is going to, he said, I'm going to do something that we will all understand. It. This is what he's saying here. For then will I turn to the people a pure language. The language of God. Whatever that language was, they were speaking at the Tower of Babel that he confounded them. I don't know. But hear what he is saying here. According to the son of Cush, the son of Hezekiah, the son of... Come on, church. Learn to appreciate yourself and study. He said, For I will then turn to the people a pure language that they may all call. He didn't say, listen, white, black, 
Chinese, Hispanic, Syrian, to the people, God's creation. The time has come for us to understand. He said, from the under rivers of Ethiopia, oh yes, my supplants, even the daughters of my disperse shall bring my offering. In that day shall thou not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away from the midst of you, midst of thee, them that rejoice in their pride. <laughs> this is deep, eh? This is deep. Do we go through these languages? Do we go through these lessons? It is for us to know. And I wish you would go back and take a look at it. God is going to call us. Deuteronomy 30 says he will gather us from the four corners of, of the earth wherein he had sent us. He will take away <laughs> from the under rivers of Ethiopia my supplant. Even the daughters of my disperse shall bring offering. In that day shall thou not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in their pride. If you look at it and say that black man, he has no IQ. His IQ is very low. He has no IQ. He's not as smart as us. I want to tell you something. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And as we close this evening, ye servants of God, your masters proclaim and publish abroad. Oh, hello, his wonderful name, the name all victorious of Jesus extolled. His kingdom is glorious and rules over all. God ruleth. On high, almighty to say, and still he is nigh. His presence we have, the great congregation. Oh, yes, Lord, be merciful. Watch over us tonight. The great congregation, keep us, shelter us. Each and every one upon the face of the earth. Bring us to that point that we'll be able to walk in unity and realize that we are one Father's children. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. May God bless you. May God make his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace. I pray, Father, a special prayer for the reveling that is taking place in the world. Help it to be, help us to understand and let them walk in wisdom. This is our culture. Help us to respect ourselves and be respectful to each other and save the innocent. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Present night, one and all. I am giving God the praise. I am giving God thanks for you all. May he bless and keep us and make his face to shine upon us and give us peace. Good night.